uh, we'll go ahead and get started. We'll start with the displeased listeners section. Last week, I asked for feedback on that. Not necessarily that I would uh, follow everything that uh, that was said, <clears throat> but I, I did want to hear what folks said. And so, of course, the response was 50-50 as to whether to continue the displeased listener section. So uh, what was consistent was the sense of uh, there are some comments that are not value added and that do not really contribute to edifying the saints. And so we're probably going to do less and less of those over time. So I, I appreciate folks providing feedback on that. And we'll try to make that section as valuable as possible. That being said, I do have a displeased listener. This is a, uh, this is a third response from someone. And so I want to deal with this hopefully briefly. So here's the comment. <clears throat> yes, Columbus Bible Church does monetize their videos because I've already stated this. I'm not sure that logically follows. I'm on YouTube too. I know how monetization works. When you click on one of his videos, it's going to give you an ad. The ad means he's monetizing his video. If there was no ad, then there would be no monetization. I can see based on your channel, you look like a baby boomer. I think he's, he's replying to someone, I think. So obviously you don't really pay much attention. You are very set in your mindset, sadly. And David Reed does not have a second job on top of what he's doing here. I'm not, that's not true. Um, I actually have a, I don't even want to get into that, but that, you know, he makes all of his money off being a pastor. How much do I make from being a pastor? I get zero income from Columbus Bible Church. I get zero income from YouTube. And I'll just tell you candidly, my expenses on behalf of Columbus Bible Church are more than zero. So if you get zero plus zero minus something, not sustainable. He makes all of his money off being a pastor. And according to Paul, you're not supposed to do that. But again, all of you guys have contacted me or ignoring what I'm talking about in my post to David Reed. So I'm actually going to make a video and be a bit more specific because apparently you guys don't have the ability of cognitive thought. Okay, so I'm going to just deal with this briefly. So let's look at this video right here. So if you look at this website address, it's support.google.com slash YouTube. Google owns YouTube. You see where it says YouTube help here? So this is a Google web page that pertains to YouTube. Now let's read what it says. I'm not a YouTube partner. So why am I seeing ads on my videos? In other words, I haven't signed up for the YouTube Partner Program. Now notice what it says here. Ads may appear on your upload, uploaded videos even if you haven't monetized the videos yourself. You understand what they're saying there? Even if you don't monetize your channel, does YouTube have the right to put ads on it? That's what they're saying. Let's look at this here. This is from Forbes. We'll read the headline, see if you can figure out what this mean, means. YouTube will now show ads on all videos, even if creators don't want them. Now, that article is dated from November 2020. So you know what YouTube does sometimes? They put ads on the videos, whether you want them or not. They don't ask you. It doesn't, you know, that's just what they do. I'm going to show you one more thing here. This website is titled, Is This Channel Monetized? And what it allows you to do is you can check and see if a YouTube channel or video is monetized. You see this search box here? What I'm going to do, this is the Columbus Bible Church YouTube channel homepage. So I'm going to grab this. I'm going to put it in here. Now, notice what it says. <laughs> the channel Columbus Bible Church is not monetized. 
you're feel, you can feel free to do your own research, you can run your own things, you can figure out if I, this is some sort of fraud or whatever. Um, it's not, spoiler. Um, and then I just a shout out to Brother Craig Nelson who directed me to that channel or that, that website. So do your own research, figure out what is true and what is not true, and let's move on. Okay, <clears throat> let's talk about salvation scenarios. I have a question that has been troubling me. I believe in Ephesians 2, 8, and 9 and Romans 11, 6 concerning salvation through grace. Once saved, always saved. However, many on YouTube, that's the first sign of a problem. However, many on YouTube are announcing that the Lord is appearing to them in visions and dreams concerning that the rapture is very near and that we need to repent when we sin and to live a holy life and not backslide to go up. In other words, the thought there is, if you're not living right when the rapture happens, then you get left behind. Lastly, a TV evangelist also listed the following verse in Pauline Doctrine against saved believers. Romans 1.30 says, or supposedly proves that once saved, always saved is not true, and we must repent, I pray, for discernment. So get 1 Timothy 4, verse 1. 1 Timothy chapter 4, verse 1. Now, while you're turning there, I'm just going to make this point. I'll read part of this. I believe in Ephesians 2, 8, 9, and Romans 11, 6 concerning salvation through grace. However, many on YouTube disagree. Well, here's the thing. If Ephesians 2, 8, 9 and Romans 11, 6 say it, and then many on YouTube disagree, what is the significance or the value of many on YouTube if the Bible clearly says something? Right? I mean, look with me at 1 Timothy 4, verse 1. Now the Spirit speaketh expressly, that in the latter times some shall depart from the faith, giving heed to seducing spirits and doctrines of devils. So 1 Timothy 4 specifically warns that what's going to happen during the latter times is that people will depart from the faith and they'll follow doctrines of devils. Moreover, all throughout the dispensation of grace, there have been false doctrines, and there have been false doctrines that deny salvation by grace. So the fact that people deny it is not really of any consequence or any moment. Look with me at Acts 20, verse 29. Acts chapter 20, and we're going to look at verse 29. Acts 20, 29. Now in Acts 20, Paul is, is meeting with the Ephesian elders, and he's meeting with them for the last time. He says in verse 29, For I know this, that after my departing shall grievous wolves enter in among you, not sparing the flock. Also of your own selves shall men arise, speaking perverse things to draw away disciples after them. Acts 20 is a very important warning. The church faces two different types of, of attacks from men. There are grievous wolves that enter in from the outside. So, so, so does the church face external dangers from wolves? And the answer to that is yes. But not only that, if you look at verse 30, of your own selves shall men arise, speaking perverse things. So are there people within the church that go into air and speak perverse things? And the answer to that is yes, that, that happens. What all of that means is that as a believer, you're going to have to be vigilant. You're going to have to exercise discernment because you face these sorts of dangers from doctrines of devils, grievous wolves, people speaking perverse things. Get with me Romans 1 verse 30. <clears throat> now I mentioned Romans 1 verse 30 because <clears throat> the, the questioner asked about this verse and suggested that it, it teaches against once saved, always saved. Well, just read the verse, backbiters, haters of God, despiteful, proud, boasters, inventors of evil things, disobedient to parents. 
And I, I don't think the verse really disproves once saved, always saved at all. Let's talk for a minute then about the conditional rapture doctrine. And this is something that, that many folks believe. And the idea is that at the rapture, God only catches up believers that are walking in the spirit, that are leading holy lives, etc. Look with me at 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 13. The notion that only some believers are caught up at the rapture is a denial of positional truth. Here's what I mean by that. 1 Corinthians 12, verse 13. For by one Spirit are we all baptized into one body, whether we be Jews or Gentiles, whether we be bond or free, and have been all made to drink into one Spirit. What 1 Corinthians 12, 13 teaches is that the moment you believe the gospel, you are spiritually baptized into Christ. If you think about Paul's writings, Paul will frequently use the word in, the preposition in, and then he'll say things like in Christ, or he will say in him. And the reason why he says that is the moment you believe the gospel, you are spiritually placed into Jesus Christ. Now think about that. That's a very profound truth. If you are placed into Jesus Christ, is it possible for you to go to the lake of fire? It's not, because Jesus Christ isn't going to the lake of fire, and you are in him. Get with me Acts 17, verse 11. <clears throat> Acts chapter 17 and verse 11. Now, this is a very well-known verse, but let's just look at it together. Acts chapter 17, verse 11. These were more noble than those in Thessalonica, in that they received the word with all readiness of mind and searched the scriptures daily, whether those things were were so. And here's, here's just the reality of the way that life on earth is going to be. Satan is the god of this world, according to 2 Corinthians 4, 4. His warfare today is not based upon haunting houses. He doesn't possess people. His warfare is doctrinal in nature. We know that because 1 Timothy 4 talks about doctrines of devils. Well, if Satan is the god of this world and the father of lies and he has doctrines of devils, what is the experience of a person on earth going to be? What are you surrounded by constantly? Lies, deceit, deception. In Acts 17, 11, the Bereans had to search the scriptures how often? Daily. Because you know what they faced daily? Deception, lies, deceit, false doctrine. W wouldn't it be nice, you know, it, I, I imagine you're this way as well. <clears throat> wouldn't, don't you like it? Don't, aren't you satisfied when you finish a project and it's done and you put it away and you don't ever have to touch it again? You know, it's resolved and it's over. Do you ever reach a point in your spiritual life where you are now immune from deception. You've, you, you know, you've arrived, that's it, there's no attacks that can happen. It doesn't happen. We're going to have to search the scriptures daily to protect ourselves. Look at 1 Thessalonians 5, verse 21. 1 Thessalonians chapter 5 and verse 21. Prove all things. And the idea there of prove all things, it's to test, it's to evaluate, to determine whether or not it's true. Prove all things, hold fast that which is good. 
Get with me 1 Timothy 6.10. 1 Timothy 6.10. For the love of money is the root of all evil, which while some coveted after they have erred from the faith and pierced themselves through with many sorrows. I'm going to give you here my opinion. You can decide whether or not this is true. In modern life, you delegate to other people 99% of what you do. For example, did anyone here build their own car? Did you build your own computer? Did you build your own home? Do you build your own roads? I mean, isn't the way that modern life works? You're dependent upon other people for almost everything that goes on. I don't know how to fix my refrigerator. I didn't build my own house. I don't do my own dentistry. There's a lot of things where you rely on other people, and it's reasonable to do that because I don't have the time or expertise to do my own dental work, right? It's just not practical. Okay. I'm going to suggest to you there are two things that you cannot delegate where it is just unreasonable and foolish to delegate them. The first is spiritual matters. What people do all the time, this is my favorite preacher. He's either the pastor of my church, or he's my favorite radio preacher, or I like his books, or whatever, and that's the person they follow. And that person, if he says it, it must be right. Well, that's a mistake, because that person, maybe he's great, maybe he's not. Typically, they're not, just to be honest with you. But even if they are, they're still fallible. They don't have everything right. Can you show up at the great white throne judgment and say, well, I believe the wrong gospel, but really, you know, Pastor Larry told me it was true. So, I mean, why are you, why are you upset with me? It's not going to work that way, right? Every man shall give account. You're going to give account for yourself. So you better prove all things. You better search it out. You better be sure that it's right. You don't want to be like, I mean, imagine showing up the great white throne and having believed the wrong gospel. You can point fingers all you want, but you're going to end up in like a fire, right? Same thing is true with the judgment seat of Christ. You're going to show up at the judgment seat of Christ. You're going to give account for your work, you better be sure it's the right work. You can't delegate that to someone else. You can't make that someone else's responsibility. That's my, the second thing I'm going to tell you that is like that, you can disagree with this one. In all matters involving finance, you need to understand what's going on. And the reason why, what does 1 Timothy 6 tell you is the root of all evil? Love money. So whenever money is involved, if you have any understanding whatsoever of human nature, whenever money is involved, the temptation to do wrong is immense. And so that's one of those things where you, 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 just, you, you have to spend the time yourself to prove all things. That's my encouragement to you on that. Next question is about Matthew 27, verse 9. Get Matthew chapter 27 and verse 9. And the question is, is Matthew 27, verse 9 an error in the KJV? Well, the short answer is no. So next question. <clears throat> but we're going to look at it a little more deeply than that. So look with me at Matthew 27, verse 9. And we're going to do a little blue letter Bible together so you can, uh, we'll show this on the screen. So Matthew 27, verse 9. Then was fulfilled that which was spoken by Jeremy the prophet, saying, And they took the 30 pieces of silver, the price of him that was valued, whom they of the children did, children of Israel did value. When it says Jeremy, in that passage. Who's that a reference to? Jeremiah, exactly. 
And the reason why it says Jeremiah is that word is translated from the Greek, and Jeremiah in the Old Testament is translated from the Hebrew, but it's the same person. Now, here's where people think this is an error. You see where it's quoted there, and they took the 30 pieces of silver, the price of him, and so on? Let's go to Zechariah 11, verse 13. And the Lord said unto me, Cast it unto the potter a goodly price that I was prized out of them. And I took the 30 pieces of silver and cast them to the potter in the house of the Lord. So when Matthew 27 refers to Jeremy, and it talks about the 30 pieces of silver and the Lord being prized at that amount, it's actually referring to Zechariah 11, verse 13. The 30 pieces of silver reference doesn't appear in Jeremiah. So some folks look at that and they say, well, that's an error in the KJV. So I want to do something with you here. So we're going to go back to Matthew 27, verse 9. <clears throat> you can see the, the verse there. But what I'm going to do here is I'm going to change this to the NKJV. So there we have the, the New King James. And notice it refers to Jeremiah the prophet as well. Let's try the NIV. So there's the NIV. Then what was spoken by Jeremiah the prophet. Let's do the New American Standard. Matthew 27, verse 9. Then that which was spoken through Jeremiah the prophet. Okay, so what is the first thing we've just learned from that? Is this problem unique to the King James Version, or is it common? It's common, because the NIV, the New American Standard, the New King James, they all say the same thing. Okay, so it's not a King James issue, is it? It's a, a Bible text issue. Well, th that is an interesting observation, but it doesn't solve the problem for us, because then it's just an error in multiple different versions. So let's go back to the King James, and we're going to do this tricky thing. Let's read the verse, and it, is it actually an error? Look with me at Matthew 27, verse 9. Then was fulfilled that which was spoken by Jeremy the prophet, saying, And they took the thirty pieces of silver, the price of him that was valued, whom they of the children of Israel did value. In Matthew 27, verse 9, what is the key word? There's a single word that explains what is going on. What word is it? The word is spoken. Matthew 27, 9 doesn't say that it was written in the book of Jeremiah. What does it say? Spoken. Let me ask you this. Did Old Testament prophets quote Old Testament books? They did. So could Zechariah have written the book of Zechariah? And Jeremiah spoken that which was written in the book of Zechariah. Now, some people won't like that because they'll say, well, I don't think that's what it means, and you're just dodging this, and you're coming up with an explanation that defends the Scriptures. Here's the thing. When God created the universe out of nothing... Was that a pretty convincing demonstration of his power? I would say it is. When God wrote the scriptures, was God careless and sloppy and, you know, oh, yeah, I mean, that's ah, just a mistake. You know, I meant to say Zechariah, but I said Jeremiah. I mean, God has more. The only, re think about this. The only reason man has any intelligence is that a God of all intelligence gave a little to man, right? 
if, it, if there wasn't an intelligent, all-wise creator God that created a creature named man with some understanding, man wouldn't have any. So what's going on in Matthew 27, verse 9, is really rather simple. And you can see this in the New Testament. There are times where New Testament writers quote other portions of the New Testament. And I'll leave that as your homework. You should check in to see if that's true or not. Maybe I made that up. I'm going to suggest to you they do that. Well, what happened here is obvious. It's written in Zechariah, but Matthew 27, 9 now gives you some new information. It was also spoken by Jeremiah. So it's not an error at all, and, and that's the way to understand it. <clears throat> Next question. It's about Ephesians chapter 2, verse 11. Ephesians chapter 2 and verse 11. And the question is, why does Ephesians 2.11 say, being in time past Gentiles? Does it mean that they are no longer Gentiles? What are they now, spiritual Jews? So look with me at Ephesians chapter 2 and verse 11. Wherefore remember that ye being in time past Gentiles in the flesh who are called uncircumcision by that which is called the circumcision in the flesh made by hands. And so the, the brother is reading this and saying, well, that's saying that, though, that in time past they were Gentiles but now they are no longer Gentiles. Now they are something else. Well, let's read three verses together. Let's read 11, 12, and 13. Wherefore remember that ye being in time past Gentiles in the flesh, who are called uncircumcision by that which is called the circumcision in the flesh made by hands, that at that time, that's time past, Ye were without Christ, being aliens from the commonwealth of Israel, and strangers from the covenants of promise, having no hope, and without God in the world. Verse 13, but now, something has changed. In Christ Jesus, ye who sometimes were far off are made nigh by the blood of Christ. What Ephesians 2, 11 to 13 is saying, it's not saying that the Ephesians were Gentiles, and then they got saved, and they ceased to be Gentiles. That's not what it's saying at all. What Ephesians 2 is saying is this. Let's look at the chart together. If you think of the chart in time past, in other words, before the dispensation of grace, the condition of Gentiles is that they were without hope. And the reason they were without hope is they were aliens from the commonwealth of Israel, and because they were aliens from the commonwealth of Israel, they were strangers from the covenants of promise. What God did in time past is he made these covenants with Israel. So if you're not Israel, if you're a Gentile, what do you have? You're not the beneficiary of the covenants because they're made with Israel. That was true in time past. But what is the case during the dispensation of grace? During the book of Acts... What happened to Israel? Israel fell and diminished to the point that during the dispensation of grace, is there any difference between Jew and Gentile? There's no difference spiritually in terms of how they get saved. So what Ephesians 2, 11 is talking about when it says, ye being in time past Gentiles in the flesh, what it's saying is, in time past, ye were without hope. And the only thing that a Gentile could do is they could become a Jew. They could, they could proselyte into the Jewish faith. But, but now, today during the dispensation of grace, Gentiles have been made, made nigh by the blood of Christ. As further proof, get Ephesians 4, verse 17. Ephesians chapter 4, verse 17. Ephesians chapter 4, verse 17. This I say, therefore, and testify in the Lord, that ye, who's the ye? It's the Ephesian saints. It's, it's who he's writing the letter to. That ye henceforth walk 
not as other Gentiles walk. Well, if Paul is addressing the Ephesian saints and he says, don't walk as other Gentiles walk, what are the Ephesian saints? They're Gentiles. That's what he's saying there. Don't walk as other Gentiles walk. They were Gentiles. They are still Gentiles. They just now are Gentiles in the body of Christ. Look with me at Galatians 3.28. Galatians chapter 3, and we'll start in verse 27. Let's do Galatians 3, verse 27. For as many of you as have been baptized into Christ have put on Christ. That's referring to the spiritual baptism that takes place when someone gets saved. Notice verse 28. There is neither Jew nor Greek... And what some will say is, is look, in, in Christ, there's neither Jew nor Greek. So Gentiles have ceased, Jews have ceased, they're all the same. Well, keep reading. There is neither Jew nor Greek, there is neither bond nor free. Well, if you're in bonds and you get saved, do your bonds disappear? They don't. Look at the next one. There is neither male nor female. If you're a male and you get saved, do you cease to be a male? You don't. If you're a female and you get saved, do you cease to be a female? You don't. Notice what it says at the end. For ye are all one in Christ Jesus. The point of Galatians 3, verses 27 and 28, if you're a male or a female, if you're bond or free, if you're Jew or Greek or Gentile, when you get saved, you are placed into the body of Christ. Spiritually in the body of Christ, there's no difference. There's no difference in the body of Christ between Jew and Greek. There's no difference in the body of Christ between male and female. But that does not mean that you lose that identity. I mean, if you were male before you got saved, you're still male. If you were Greek before you got saved, you're still Greek. The point is it's making a spiritual truth that there's no difference spiritually in Christ. That's the point that's being made there. Next question. Why did Peter keep preaching the circumcision of the gospel to the Jews after he agreed with Paul that the gospel of grace that Paul received was from God? Why didn't he immediately begin to preach it? Get Galatians 2 verse 7. And what that question is asking, when Peter comes to the realization that Paul has received a gospel from the Lord Jesus Christ, why doesn't Peter just start preaching exactly what Paul did? Well, there's a reason. Look at Galatians 2, verse 7. But contrarywise, when they saw that the gospel of the uncircumcision was committed unto me, as the gospel of the circumcision was unto Peter. If you read that verse literally, as you should, Peter and Paul had different gospels. Paul had the gospel of the uncircumcision. Peter had the gospel of the circumcision. And some folks will say, well, no, that's really not what it means. They went to different people, but their gospels were all the same. Well, if their Gospels are the same, why does Peter say, repent and be baptized in Acts 2.38, and Paul says, for Christ sent me not to baptize, but to preach the Gospel? Those Gospels are not the same. Look with me at Galatians 2, verse 8. For he that wrought effectually in Peter to the apostleship of the circumcision... The same was mighty in me toward the Gentiles. And when James, Cephas, and John, who seemed to be pillars, perceived the grace that was given unto me, they agreed that we would all start preaching the same thing. They gave to me and Barnabas the right hands of fellowship, that we should go unto the heathen, and they unto the circumcision. In other words, they reach an agreement that they're going to go to different audiences because they have different apostleships 
and they have different Gospels. So the reason that Peter didn't begin preaching Paul's Gospel is Peter had a different apostleship and he had a different message. Look with me at Matthew 19, verse 28. Matthew chapter 19, verse 28. And while you're turning there, I'll just make this point. If you're saved, if you're a member of the body of Christ today, are you under the Old Testament law? You're not, because Romans 6, 14 says, For ye are not under the law, but under grace. So therefore, you don't have to keep the requirements of Leviticus. You don't have to observe all the things that are written in the Old Testament law. Well, if you ever read Acts chapter 21, when Paul goes to Jerusalem, what does James say to him? In Acts 21, after Acts 9, after the agreement in Acts 15, Acts 21, years and years later, James says to him, ye see how many thousands of Jews there are which believe, and they are all zealous of the law. Now, I realize people want to say Peter and Paul have the exact same message. That's something people say. That's not something Scripture would teach you. Paul says, you're not under the law, Romans 6, 14, Acts 21, verse 20. James says, look at these thousands of Jews. They're obviously kingdom saints, and they are all what? Zealous of the law. Those are not the same things. Being zealous of the Old Testament law and not under the Old Testament law are completely different. Peter and Paul simply did not have the same gospel. Now, I ask you to turn to Matthew 19, 28. Look at it with me. Matthew 19, 28. And Jesus said unto them, Verily I say unto you, that ye which have followed me in the regeneration when the Son of Man shall sit in the throne of his glory... Ye also shall sit upon twelve thrones, judging the twelve tribes of Israel. What the Lord is saying there to the twelve apostles, if you you look at the chart, in the regeneration when the kingdom is established, what are the twelve going to be doing? They're going to be sitting on twelve thrones, judging the twelve tribes of Israel. In other words, the twelve are promised an earthly inheritance, not a heavenly inheritance, right? In Ephesians 1, verse 3, Paul describes the blessings of the body of Christ as all spiritual blessings in heavenly places. Paul says in 2 Corinthians 5, verse 1, that if the earthly tabernacle that we have is dissolved, we have a house not made with hands, eternal in the heavens. Well, if your house is eternal in the heavens, you're not going to spend eternity on the new earth. Right? Now think about this with me. Peter and the twelve did not get into the body of Christ And they did not preach Paul's gospel because according to Matthew 19, 28, his plan for them was not for them to be in the new heavens. His plan for them was to be on the new earth. They had a different gospel, different apostleship, and they had a different future destiny. And that's why the 12, including Peter, did not immediately begin to preach Paul's gospel because they were given a different gospel, different responsibility. Next question, why the overlap in gospel preaching at the beginning? And I think what that's asking is during the, during the book of Acts, why are there two different gospels preached at the same time? How did that work and why? When did the kingdom gospel preaching end? What happened to the Jews who believed the kingdom gospel? Did they later have to change and believe the grace gospel? So lots of different questions there. Let's start with this. Why the overlap in gospel preaching at the beginning? How did that work and why? Let me ask you a question. 
Who received the dispensation of grace? Who received the revelation of the mystery? Paul. Paul. Okay, perfect. Now, next question. This is a tricky one. This is a math one. When God revealed the dispensation of grace to Paul, the second after the Lord Jesus Christ did that, how many people knew it? One. One. Kathy's always good at math, so appreciate that. She's right. Now think about that. So you're Paul, you receive the mystery, you're the, you're the sole person that knows it. What does everyone on else do? What does every other saved person on earth know, believe, and preach? The gospel of the kingdom, because they don't know what you know. God gave the dispensation of grace to one man, Paul. So when he's given it to Paul, and Paul has to make all men see, Paul now has a responsibility to go do that. But does the kingdom gospel have a big head start? There's thousands of people that know it, believe it, and teach it. And it's simply going to take time, or the reason why two gospels were preached at the same time, when God appears to Paul, when the Lord Jesus Christ does, and gives him the revelation of the mystery, he doesn't appear to everyone else on earth. So everyone else on earth is simply continuing with what they've been taught. So it's, it's completely natural that both Gospels were preached at the same time. And both Gospels were preached during the book of Acts. But with the close of the Acts period, the kingdom Gospel is no longer preached. Can someone today do this? Can someone say, well, look, I've read Paul's 13 epistles but I've also read Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. I've also read the Hebrew epistles. And so I have decided I'm going to follow the kingdom gospel. I just like it better. It speaks to me. You can't do that because with the close of the Acts period, the kingdom gospel is not how anyone is saved today. Let me ask you something else. People will sometimes say this. There was an overlap at the beginning of the dispensation of grace. Both Gospels were preached at the same time. So if we're being consistent, there has to be an overlap at the end of the dispensation of grace. Is that true? It's not true, and it doesn't make sense. What is the basic reason it doesn't make sense? The dispensation of grace ends in a moment in a what? The twinkling of an eye. How long does it take the dispensation of grace to end? That's it. So is there an overlap? No, because the dispensation of grace comes to an end in an instant. Look with me at Acts 13, verse 46. Now, we won't turn to Romans 11:12, 12, but I'll just make this point in passing. When, when Romans 11 speaks of the fall of Israel, it tells you that the fall is a diminishing. Here's what I mean by that. When you think of the word fall, the word fall can have an instantaneous sense or it can have a gradual sense. So, for example, if you fall on ice... It's quick, right? It's in a moment. You're upright, you slip, you're prone the next second. That's how falling on ice works. When people talk about the fall of the Roman Empire, what are they saying? It didn't happen in a second. It was a declension. It took place over time. When Romans 11:12 refers to the fall and diminishing of Israel, is a diminishing a second or is it a declension. It's a declension. It's a diminishing. It's a diminution. Look at me at Acts 13, verse 46. Then Paul and Barnabas waxed bold and said, it was necessary that the word of God should first have been spoken to you, but seeing ye put it from you and judge yourselves unworthy of everlasting life, lo, we turn to the Gentiles. Get Acts 18, 6. Acts chapter 18 and verse 6. And when they opposed themselves and blasphemed, he shook his raiment and said unto them, Your blood be upon your own heads. I am clean. 
from henceforth I will go unto the Gentiles. Acts 28, verse 28. Acts chapter 28 and verse 28. Be it known therefore unto you that the salvation of God is sent unto the Gentiles and that they will hear it. Now those three verses that we read are very similar. Acts 13 is Antioch in Pisidia. Acts 18 is Corinth. Acts 28 is Rome. And what you see is you see the threefold proclamation in, in areas farther and farther from Jerusalem that Paul is going to go to the Gentiles. Now, if you notice the language, Acts 13, what he says is, we turn. Acts 18 says, I will go. And then Acts 28 says what? It is sent. What all of that is telling you is that what you're seeing in the Acts period is you're seeing the diminishing of Israel. And by the time you get to the end of the, uh, of the Acts period, the, the, the kingdom gospel has been diminished. It, it, the, the, the setting aside of Israel, the diminishing is complete. Next question related to that. What happened to the Jews who believed the kingdom gospel? Did they later have to change and believe the grace gospel? Get Romans 11, verse 29. Romans chapter 11, verse 29. Romans eleven twenty nine, 29. For the gifts and calling of God are without repentance. Romans eleven twenty nine 29 teaches that the way God's gifts work is they are without repentance. Does God give something to you and then take it back? And the answer to that is no, he doesn't do that. So what happened to kingdom believers who believe the gospel of the kingdom? The gifts and calling of God are without repentance. Once they believe the kingdom gospel, their eternal destiny was set on the earth. God didn't transfer kingdom believers as a whole into the body of Christ because he didn't take away the blessing that he had promised to them on the earth. Next question. I've heard many grace preachers often say that Christ is not our king, he is our head. But in 1 Timothy 1.17, Paul addresses him as king. Can you expound on this? Get 1 Timothy 1.17. 1 Let me apply this to myself. If I'm your friend and I say a stupid thing, it's still a stupid thing even if I'm your friend. Right? Isn't that true? That's the way truth works. Truth doesn't depend on who says it. Right? So if a grace preacher that you love says something that's wrong, what is it? It's, it's wrong. It doesn't matter who says it. And by the way, if there's someone you don't like and they say something that's true, it's still true. That's the way truth works. So the question here is, I've heard many grace preachers often say, Christ is not our king, he is our head. 1 Timothy 1, verse 17. Now unto the king eternal, immortal, invisible, the only wise God, be honor and glory forever and ever, amen. Jesus Christ is King of kings and Lord of lords. He's the King of all kings. He is the Lord of all lords. No exception. Kingdom program, grace program, the entire universe, all of creation. He's the King of kings. So is Jesus Christ the King? And the answer is, He is. Period. The end. So when people say, Dumb things, the answer is people say dumb things, and you, you had not to pay attention to dumb things that people say. If people say a lot of dumb things, you probably ought to quit listening to them, right? That would be my advice, you know. 
Let me give you another one. This, this one kind of drives me crazy. This is my own personal one. I've heard people say things like the following. Jesus is the head of the body. He's not our Messiah. He was a Messiah to Israel, and you are not Israel. And so the argument is, Jesus Christ was Messiah to Israel. He's not your Messiah. He's the head of the body. He's only a Messiah to Israel. And people think that's a smart thing to say because Paul never uses the word Messiah. So if Paul doesn't use the word Messiah, then he must not be your Messiah. Well, get with me John 141. And, and I'll, just, I'll just make this comment and you can decide for yourself. When someone says something like, Jesus Christ is not the Messiah to the body of Christ, if you have ears of discernment, that person is telling you they have no idea what they're talking about. By the way, does Paul ever use the word hell? Paul never uses the word hell. So there's crazy people that say things like, there is no hell during the dispensation of grace. But in 2 Thessalonians 1, Paul talks about inflaming fire, taking vengeance. He talks in 2 Thessalonians 1 about everlasting destruction. Is there a hell for unbelievers during the dispensation of grace? Of course there is. The fact that Paul doesn't actually use the word hell doesn't mean that it doesn't exist. If you just read what he says, it's obvious that there's everlasting destruction for those that don't believe. So I asked you to get John 141. Let's read it together. He first findeth his own brother Simon, and saith, saith unto him, We have found the Messiah, which is being interpreted the Christ. So if we just read that verse, what does the word Messiah mean? Christ. I mean, what could be, it, it tells you what it means. You don't even need to use a dictionary. It tells you that the word Messiah means Christ. Look with me at John 20, verse 31. The word Messiah means Christ on the authority of Scripture itself. John 20, verse 31. But these are written that ye might believe that Jesus is the Christ. Then notice what it says, the Son of God. What does the word Christ mean? The word Christ means the Son of God. So the word Messiah means Christ. The word Christ means the Son of God. Hopefully you're following along. Look at Acts 17, verse 3. Acts chapter 17, verse 3. We'll start in verse 2. Acts 17, verse 2. And Paul, as his manner was, went in unto them, and three Sabbath days reasoned with them, out of the scriptures, opening and alleging that Christ must needs have suffered and risen again from the dead, and that this Jesus, whom I preach unto you, is Christ. So let me ask you this. Did Paul preach that Jesus was the Messiah to the body of Christ? Of course he did. He, so let's just lay this out real specifically. John 141, the word Christ means Messiah, right? Christ means Messiah. In Acts 17, verse 3, Paul specifically says that Jesus is the Christ. Well, if Paul preaches that Jesus is the Christ, he's preaching he's the Messiah because that's what the word Messiah means. It's irresistible, it's not complicated, it's straightforward. So even though Paul never uses the word Messiah, he's clearly teaching that Jesus Christ is the Messiah. I get a lot of questions like this. 
I heard a grace preacher say such and such, but Scripture says the opposite. How do you reconcile this? Well, the answer is you don't. Because if Scripture says this, and a grace preacher says that, then Scripture is right, and the grace preacher is wrong. And by the way, that applies to me, right? So if I say something dumb that's unscriptural, then it's wrong. Honestly, I can't tell you how many times I get questions where people say, I heard a grace preacher say. Okay. The authority is the scriptures. And so we need to be diligent about proving all things. Get with me 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 7. And actually, you know, we're about, we're about 8. I'm going to go ahead and pause here and we will we'll take up here next time. So we'll start with the 1 Corinthians 2 chapter 7 and 8 question. Uh, let, let me close this in a word of prayer. Lord, thank you for the time to meet together. We thank you for the saints, both here and, and online. We pray for the body of Christ, Lord, that the body of Christ would grow in discernment. The body of Christ would grow in, in, in joy and peace and would, would walk more fully in the Spirit and would please you in all things. We rejoice in what you've given us in Jesus Christ, and it's in his name that we pray. Amen.